The marriage debate surfaced here about two months ago with the advent of a TV ad featuring one of our professors. But in that time, no one has meaningfully advanced on this campus opposition to same-sex marriage. The TV ad itself was short and it was not connected to this school. A short event following the ad's release was about religious freedom, not about the underlying issues. Thus, today's presentation will be the first to formally advance this particular viewpoint on this campus this year. Yet the relative absence of this viewpoint does not reflect the state of things nationally. Americans have now 31 times in 31 different states democratically chosen to maintain the current definition of marriage as between one man and one woman. With the public so clearly decided in one direction, we would be remiss if we did not provide an advocate the opportunity to make the case for this public decision. Thus, by today's presentation, BC's chapter of the FedSoc hopes to allow people of goodwill to hear those reasons advanced coherently. Okay, real quick, words about Ms. Gallagher, I'll let, then I'll let her go. She's the president of two organizations, National Organization for Marriage and the Institute for Marriage and Public Policy, nationally syndicated columnist, author of three books on marriage, and a leading voice of the new marriage movement. She appears frequently in major TV and radio, and is regularly asked to lecture at colleges, universities, and law schools. She's testified as an expert witness on marriage before the Senate and at various state legislatures. Her writings appear on, in uh, the New York Times, the Weekly Standard, the Wall Street Journal, as well as scholarly journals such as the Louisiana Law Review and the Notre Dame Journal of Law, Ethics, and Public Policy. And she lives in the Washington, D.C. area with her husband, and one child has moved out, but her other child is still at home. So without further ado, Maggie Gallagher. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sean, and to the Federalist Society and to Boston College of Law and all of you who are here. I'd like to start by getting a sense of who I'm talking to. So I'd like to ask for a show of hands um, how many people are inclined to think they're in favor of same-sex marriage, how many are inclined to be opposed, and then how many people are either uncertain or really think it's in inappropriate for me to ask because it's none of my business either way. So that kind of launched me into this other marriage debate about whether all the things, all the credentialed and, and important people with their white science jackets were saying about how progressive it was, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the disengagement of marriage and child marriage uh, and the fragmentation of the family, how progressive and wonderful and an increase in human freedom, it kind of gave me a personal perspective. Um, and it launched me into a larger uh, debate about the meaning and importance of marriage as a social institution. And for years and years, I avoided the gay marriage issue entirely for all the reasons you hear people say now. They, uh, our, our, you know, our, I, did, I didn't want us to get distracted from the idea that we needed to do something about divorce and unmarried childbearing. Um, and, I also thought it was a very remote issue, that it was very unlikely to happen. Uh, and it created uh, partisan divisions and ideological divisions in what was really a very fragile and precious example of a genuinely cross-ideological bipartisan social movement. Um, and um, then in 2003, as you know, here in Massachusetts, we learned that gay marriage was no longer a theoretical question, that a court was actually going to create it. And uh, so I was, I remember very vividly being at a movement of leaders in this, this, this so other marriage movement and saying, well, you know, shouldn't we talk about what we think about gay marriage? And at first everyone was like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to talk about it. And then I said, okay, I know we're not going to make any pronouncements, but shouldn't we at least listen to each other? What it's going to happen? What, what do we think about this? We're the marriage people. And so I raised my hand in that discussion, and I said something that has been very core to uh, my work in this issue ever since. I said, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, what I've been doing with my life for the last 15 or 20 years is going around the country and saying, there's a smart version of what I've been doing, but this stupid, dumb, obvious version is I'm going around the country saying, listen, marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad, and adults have a really serious obligation to make personal sacrifices if necessary, not necessarily unlimited ones, but to sacrifice to get that great good for their children. And I said, I, if they do this in Massachusetts, I don't think that I can come to Massachusetts and say marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad. Because in the first case, the law is going to be immediately repudiating me. It's going to be saying in a very clear and obvious way that this is not the purpose of marriage in Massachusetts. 
And secondly, as I thought it through, I, I, I believe that, that my, this vision of marriage, my vision, but also the vision that leads marriage to be a cross-cultural, universal human social institution, is not only going to be privatized, it's going to be stigmatized and marginalized and treated as an example of, of uh, bigotry and discrimination, right? So I quit my job, I founded a little think tank, I went all around the country talking about trying to call attention to what, at a time when I thought the issue was too dominated, both pro and con by what people think about homosexuality or, or gay and lesbian civil rights, to say, listen, this is also a fairly profound change in the public understanding of marriage, and, and um, I think at a minimum we need to be concerned about it. So I founded the National Organization for Marriage with Princeton professor Robbie George to create a single issue, large national activist organization capable of acting on my belief that it's important to protect marriage as the union of husband and wife. Um, we were the single largest donors to Prop 8 and played a key role in getting that on the ballot. And we also, by an even much larger measure, we, we came up with problem, I don't have the final figures, but more than half the money in the main I meant a referendum. So, so I've done. I've I've made this case at the Gay and Lesbian Journalists Association at the National Gay and Lesbian Institute at Aspen ten days ago at Hofstra University Gay Pride Day. Um, I I think it's a it's intended to be at least in my part, however it's received, as a as a gesture of intellectual respect to people with whom I profoundly disagree. But I think you have to be willing to make your case with a gay person in the room in a way that respects us all as fellow citizens, even when we disagree on an issue as, as difficult as this. So what do I say? Okay. For me, the heart, the place to start, the heart of the argument for me, is to recognize that marriage is a virtually universal human social institution. Okay? It exists in virtually every known human society, which is not to say that in all of those human societies, the vision of marriage is uh, exactly like, or even in many ways, remotely similar to our own marriage tradition, which actually has deep roots in, in Judeo-Christian religious ideas and culture. Um, but that, uh, so there's a lot of weird stuff out there. But nonetheless, all around the world, in every known human society, there's something that has a recognizable shape called marriage. Um, and marriage is a universal human idea, looks something that sort of the, the basic shape of the architecture looks something like this. Okay. First of all, marriage is a public union. It's not just a private, personal, and intimate or sacred union. Okay. It's a sexual union. It's not some other kind of union. Between at least one man and one woman, because frankly polygamy is a fairly common human variant, especially among small tribal societies, in which the rights and the responsibilities of the man and the woman towards each other and towards any children of their union are publicly defined and supported, which is to say, we don't just leave it up to young adults and adolescents in the middle of their erotic, romantic, sexual, and psychological dramas, being young myself once, I remember them, to work out on their own what this whole big sphere of human experience means, right? Over and over again, human beings come up with something that is recognizably this basic marriage idea. And if you pause to ask the question, which most people do not, I don't think the answer is that hard to find. Marriage as a universal human idea has deep roots in three persistent truths about human beings everywhere. The first is that the overwhelming majority of us are powerfully attracted and not by reason to an act that makes new human life. Okay, news bulletin. Sex between men and women makes babies, okay? The second truth is that society needs babies. Reproduction is optional for the individual. Not everybody has to do it. But only those human cultures that successfully figure out a strategy for grappling with the procreative implications of male-female sexual attraction survived to become one of the human possibilities that our anthropologists went out and busily recorded. The third core idea on which marriage is based is that children need a father as well as a mother. What happens if we move to gay marriage? What happens, you know, the, the, 
the heart of understanding the argument with which I'm, most of you disagree is to realize that marriage is not just a set of small... <coughs> the worst part about Goodrich decision, from my point of view, is the statement that what we have here is a licensing scheme, you know, as if marriage were like, we license people who, you know, we license the dog catcher, we license physicians, it's just a, a licensing scheme the government dreamed up. When, when obviously, it's obvious to me at least, that marriage as a legal institution has power only to the extent that it is supported by and reinforced by a social, a social, a, a, the social institution of marriage, which government cannot create, but can't possibly uh, make it more difficult for it to be embodied and to live. So the most important thing about marriage to me is that it's an idea. The most important function of the law of marriage in modern times is that it names the reality of who is married. This is why, by the way, I get that the word marriage is a big deal to, to uh, gay marriage advocates, including gay and lesbian people. I don't dismiss that argument at all. But it works in both directions. You know, in order to change the meaning of the word so that gay unions are marriages, you're going to have to change the meaning of the word in a way that also at least potentially matters. And it matters more when I, as I sat through, again, this process of trying to figure out what this change would mean, because believe me, it's not especially fun being the girl who goes, I mean, I'm not complaining. People treat me really well. It's, I'm very lucky. But it's, you know, sometimes you sit around and think somebody must have dropped you on your head to decide that you're going to wade in on the opposite side of the most contested and controversial moral civil rights issue of our time. So, but I, and the reason I did so is, is that as I thought through what this is going to mean, I said, Okay, the first place, this, oh, this ancient idea of marriage, this cross-cultural idea, deep roots in our own religious traditions, no question, but spanning across human experience, that, you know, marriage really matters because children need a mother and father, that the reason the government has a stake in trying to encourage people to enter faithful sexual unions of two and no more has something to do with this crucial task that Unions of husbands and wives are necessary to the broader good. Other relationships may be even morally superior, but they're not necessary in the same way that if you do not get young men and women to commit to marriage and to making the next generation, you've got a social problem on the one hand with the, the enormous suffering and needs of children of, who end up abandoned by their fathers and women who are overloaded with parenting alone. And then you lose, you know, at its core, you, you know, if, 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 you, if you really, as, as we're seeing in Europe now, you really can't persuade enough young people to decide they care about getting married and having children, your civilization itself can just fail to reproduce itself. What I find now is, as I found in Maine, I went up and I said exactly this. I said, listen, um, uh, Marriage is not discrimination, which is what I believe. Unions of husbands and wives really are unique because these are the only kind of unions that can both make new life and connect those children in love to their own mother and father. And the radio host, who I, I, didn't, I don't know for sure, but I think he's a white liberal straight guy. He's not, I don't think he's a gay guy. Turned to me immediately and he said, I can't believe I'm hearing such bigotry, right? Increasingly, it's becoming obvious what I knew this would happen because I know that framing ideas are very powerful. The, problem, the reason this is a really difficult debate, and I don't enjoy that it's a difficult debate, I don't know how to reduce the, moral, the, the temperature or create a space where everyone... We, we, I think there's a fundamental moral disagreement, and it, that's what makes it hard. It, it's real. We're not trumping it up. The heart of the gay marriage idea goes something like this. And again, I'm not trying to caricature it. I'm trying to capture it with respect for people with whom I, I disagree. There is no morally relevant difference between same-sex and opposite-sex unions when it comes to marriage. And if you see a difference, there's something wrong with you. Okay? You're like a person who opposed interracial marriage. You're, if not a bigot, you're, you're endorsing discrimination. right? And the problem is that that gay marriage idea is not just an add-on to the marriage idea, it's a direct contradiction to the heart 
of the older marriage idea that it seeks to replace, which is that there's something special about unions of husbands and wives. The marriage sits there in the lawn and it points and it says, look, there's something special about this kind of union that justifies its unique status in law, culture, and society. And if you go through the, the legal history, much less the cultural history of the institution, it is extremely clear that that something special is intimately related to the idea that male-female sexual unions make new life. The religious liberty implications of gay marriage, for me as a marriage person, that's part of the institutional lever for how gay marriage is going to suppress the older marriage culture and replace it with a new government idea about marriage, which is, I don't know, gay marriage advocates will have to define it. I would say it's probably that marriage is about putting a good government housekeeping seal on loving adult relationships. Okay, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm not formally a libertarian, but I really don't understand why the government is involved in anyone's intimate relationships if it's not about something critically necessary to the common good. Um, and uh, we're very early in this gay marriage debate. The argument that is the most powerful argument out there, I will tell you, is not the civil rights argument. It isn't even, although I think it's stronger, that love makes a family. The strongest argument out there is that gay marriage is not really going to affect you, so why should you care about it? So if, if, if an idea you have is contrary to basic democratic norms of equality, the government acts to repress or marginalize you in a variety of ways. How? Uh, professional licenses are a big lever. Uh, can you be a uh, physician? Well, there's a California physician who was fined by the government for being unwilling to personally impregnate a lesbian couple. Can you be a marriage counselor and not counsel gay people on how to keep their relationship together? Can you even do it if you have a segregated Christian marriage counseling program? Uh, unclear, there's a case in Georgia about even the willingness to refer to another counselor wasn't good enough. Can you um, be a licensed social worker? How many of you know who Don Mandel is? Don, Don Mandel is a high school teacher in Maine who appeared in an ad uh, uh, favoring Yes on One, which overturned gay marriage. Immediately after, he, and by the way, this was in response to an ad by a, uh, another teacher who was Teacher of the Year supporting gay marriage. So he appeared in a rebuttal ad. And uh, immediately, several complaints were filed with the, the, uh, at the, the Social Worker Ethics Licensing Board because they're part of your obligation as a social worker is not to encourage discrimination. And so the man, the, there was a big public debate in Maine. There was a school teacher who was for gay marriage and a school teacher who was against gay marriage. And the one who's against gay marriage now faces a threat to his livelihood. I personally think the fact that the majority of voters overturned gay marriage is going to help him keep his job. I don't know. Technically, it may be a separate issue. Um, school accreditation. Can you be an accredited school that organizes around and promotes racism? It's unclear, but it's a problem. Tax exempt status. That's the like 800 pound gorilla. That's the biggest lever the government has. We're very early in this process at a time when the big argument is the sky won't fall. The sky never does fall. You can do anything you want if that's the argument. Um, but we've already seen things that I never imagined. I mean, really, even 10 years ago, I never imagined that Catholic charities could be driven out of the adoption business in Massachusetts. Uh, I think that's quite extraordinary. I never imagined that a Methodist group in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, would be told that it has to uh, permit its property to be used for gay wedding ceremonies or civil union ceremonies if it allows its property to be used for weddings. I, I, the reason this is happening is not that some people are bad or mean, it's because ideas are very powerful things. And if the core of the argument for same-sex marriage is that there is no difference that's morally relevant between same-sex and opposite-sex couples, this is an idea which when the government adopts it and puts it into law is going to affect a lot of people. There are, I think, by the way, alternate ways of getting, of understanding both gay rights and gay marriage. Um, and I think that uh, somewhere, I hope, farther down the road, we might have a different kind of public debate for which I would 
take full responsibility for helping to contribute to. But I guess what I would like to convey to you is, if you're in favor of gay marriage, is that there's a whole lot of people out there. We don't know where the line is going to be drawn because we are not in charge of drawing the line. The line is rapidly changing in a way that makes it increasingly unclear whether you're going to be able to participate as a full member of society if you believe, I do as a marriage supporter or as a Roman Catholic, both of which I am, that marriage is the union of husband and wife, that there are good reasons why that's the union, it is the union of husband and wife, and that same-sex unions simply aren't marriage, whatever their other benefits are. Um, there, um, I don't have an easy answer for how you get to a better place in this debate, because I do understand the opposite point of view. I do really do understand why gay marriage advocates believe so passionately what they believe. The first step to finding a different solution is to get out of a space. What's ha what I perceive happening now, and I guess what, if, you're not, if you're not in my shoes, if you're not out there talking about gay marriage from the, my point of view, you won't see it. What I perceive happening now since Prop 8 is a virtual tidal wave of uh, what I, feels like licensed hatred directed at people who don't agree on gay marriage and uh, that it's, um, there's a delegitimation of opposition. So this is, I've been in a lot of moral, hot button moral issues in my 25 years as a syndicated columnist. I've never been in one where so many people say there's no possible reason to disagree with me. It's a, it's a reason that, that makes moral monsters out of half the American people. And I guess for that reason alone, even if you think that we are deeply wrong and that gay marriage needs to win, I would say something good might happen if we could at least begin a process of a debate where we recognize why somebody who, not me in particular, I'm half, I mean I volunteered to be the hate symbol of the century on this, but at least not me, you know, somewhere else among the other 50, you know, the other 150 million Americans, some of whom you know, <coughs> that they are not moral monsters, that maybe they have their fingers on something that a good person could care about, even if they're wrong. Thank you very much for hearing me out. I'm grateful for you. Thanks. President Bloom. Uh, just with regard to the last comment, I have a question. Sure. I think the hatred goes in both directions. Yes. Uh, I appreciate your concern for having mother and father, father piece, I appreciate it. But what I got from that was more the notion of two loving parents as opposed to one loving parent. I think two loving parents are always better than I I three are three loving parents, parents better than two? Excuse me? Are three loving parents better than two? In some instances, I would suggest. Would you think all? You just said two are always better than one. I don't think a husband and a wife, one of whom might not be a loving parent, is as good as having two husbands or two wives or however you want to characterize them. Having loving parents as opposed to having one loving parent is better than two. I'm not going to talk about three or four. Well, I don't know. You just enunciated a principle. I was wondering no, whether I'm, it's I'm two to, I'm or to one. Okay, I'll, I'll respond to it then since I, I can't. Male, I'll... Some males have not been involved in the family. So I'm saying, and, 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 and if I take that inference from that, that two parents are better than one parent. I think that's what you. That isn't what I said. See, you, 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 I, that's, what I, that's what you heard, but it isn't what I said. I don't know what you said, but that's what Well, what I said is the ideal for the child is the child's mother and father, that the two people who made the baby, and that this should be the, the sort of the norm. So, so, so what did you say? Now, two hateful parents. Now? What about adopted children? Well, I think adopt, well, yeah, what, what about them? I think it's great. I think adoption is a great thing, but it's a great happy ending to something that is intrinsically wrong. It's wrong that a child has not even one of its own parents <coughs> willing or able to care for him. So adoption is where we step in and say, let's create a happy ending for that child, and I think it's a noble institution. But it serves a different role than, than, than marriage. I, I think children are entitled to loving parents. Most important, whether they be adopted or have 
gay parent or a loving father or mother or loving gay okay. parent? Okay. I think that that's... I think that's I important think... for children. You care about children, as do I. Okay. I, I, I would not disagree that loving parents are very important for children. What I would say, and that there are people, that every child, regardless of their family form, is important and deserves support. What I would say is there is a particular problem that marriage addresses, which is the problem of how do you connect, I mean, how do you connect sex, love, babies, mother and fathers. It doesn't happen unless you have a marriage culture. Okay, so that's the problem that's being addressed, and we address it on the negative and the positive. I don't think that you're going to be as successful at raising young men to make the sacrifices to be good family men if you just say a child needs two adults, and you don't tell young men that a child needs his father, and that fathers have an obligation. Why? Why? Well, we, we could have a more extended debate, but I want to let someone else in here about why is it, sure, a child needs two, two parents, but why is it that the two parents who happen to conceive the child are obligated to raise the child, right? What, why, when do we respect the natural obligations of the family and prioritize it? And when do we say it's just any two adults? Why isn't it a mother and, 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 and her mother raising the child? Why does that man have to be involved? It becomes unclear if you make the dividing line. We think two parents are better than one. We're not exactly sure why, because we can't exactly say that three parents are better than two. We just think empirically two are better than one. What we've lost in that is any visible public um, respect or principle that there's something core about this phenomenon that when you have sex, you make babies. The two people who make the baby are responsible for it. That every child has a mother and father, and ideally that mother and father would be raising for it. That's perfectly consistent with saying, heck, that's the ideal, but there's a lot of kids in other situations, and we need other institutions like adoption to help protect them. But you don't, in my view, you don't get, anything, get any closer if you eliminate the ideal in the roadmap by describing that ideal as discriminatory or by rewriting it in your head. So you didn't hear, I never said two parents are better than one. I said the ideal is the child's mother and father. You can retranslate that, but that's what's gonna happen with gay marriage. You're gonna lose the capacity to recognize and point to the mother, father, and the family as the ideal. Um, don't you worry that you're gonna stigmatize children who don't have an ideal? You're saying that you know, there's an issue, or not necessarily an issue, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that the problem needs to be examined if the child is raised by its mother and its grandmother. Then any child who has anything other than a two-parent ideal you're describing is then in turn being stigmatized by you and your organization. Um, the answer to that is n no, I haven't found that to be true because in part, I, as I said, I did this for about 20 years. I found mothers who often got, uh, not often, but occasionally got upset if you said the ideal is a mother and father because they worried whether that disrespected them. Um, I actually never had a child of divorce or unmarried childbearing or come up to me and do anything but say thank you, thank you, thank you. And then in another presentation, I would explain exactly what happens when you lose this ideal in a practical and all, because they, they, they know that it's a lot more difficult. Um, so I, uh, I would just say on a practical level, I don't think that that's what happens, that it's not about stigmatizing the children, nor do you need to stigmatize the children of gay couples to say there's something significant about the natural family and that marriage is, is deeply and intrinsically oriented towards that particular good. It's not the only thing. There's lots of people who aren't married. You know, I don't believe in stigmatizing people who aren't married. Um, so that would be my answer. I think it's practically quite, you know, we're, we're well on our way to learning how to do that. If you were opposing the adoption, you would have to do that, but I'm not. Adoption, see, ado this is it. I don't think the fact that gay people can adopt means that those unions are marriages. I think it means that, I followed this debate really closely in the early 90s, by the way, 
And you will, you can, I, I've written a lot of things, and I don't think anyone can find that I ever wrote about any of these issues until gay marriage became the issue. That may be my moral blockheadedness, but one of the reasons I didn't is that when gay adoption was an issue in the early 90s, and most states moved to incorporate gay adoption in their practice in the 80s and 90s, nobody ever said, well, we should have gay adoption because children don't need a mother and father. What they said was, children need parents. And a good gay home is better for a child than having, you know, being in an orphanage or foster care. And I was like, well, that seems reasonable to me. I actually even believe it's possible that uh, gay couples could, on average, be much better parents than opposite sex couples, precisely because they don't have children as a result of sexual passion, right? So, but not, none of that would lead me to conclude that we should redefine marriage and wrench it off its roots at addressing this problem and idealizing this ideal. I mean, this is what I really think. We have a new problem in society. How do we demonstrate respect and compassion for gay people and integrate them into society? And marriage was chosen, really, for a variety of reasons as the symbolic, the symbol of that integration and respect, which is another reason why the debate is so intense and personal, and I understand that. It's not a criticism, I'm just trying to describe the reality. But I don't think it's intrinsically, I mean, it's not intrinsically necessary that we could have settled on marriage as the one symbol for doing that. I know gay people who voted against Prop 8, I mean, voted for Prop 8. There are gay people who don't believe in gay marriage. They're a very tiny fraction, I'm sure, I don't know how many, but secretly they email me and tell me what they think. So it's possible to put together reality in a way that doesn't necessarily make marriage the linchpin of do you have respect for gay people as fellow citizens or even their families. And I will say this, I don't know how many gay people are in this room, but if you are going to have children, do not rely on your Massachusetts marriage to establish your parenting rights. Get a second parent adoption because it's dangerous for you as a parent to take, I mean, you, your, your marriage may or may not be recognized in other states, much less if you happen to your plane crashes in Saudi Arabia, but your adoption will be recognized as a matter of international treaty conventions pretty much everywhere. So um, that's I just like to throw that out there because I, the idea of you know not being able to legally protect your children actually I find very moving. And what your view was of the intellectual merits of the following advertisement slash statement, and do such ads like for Prop One or Prop Eight help the discussion and remove bigotry or just assist it? And the ad went, unless question one passes, there will be real consequences for mayors. Legal experts predict a flood of lawsuits against individuals, small businesses, and religious groups. Church organizations could lose their tax exemptions. Homosexual marriage taught in public schools, whether their parents like it or not. And does that contribute to the discussion? I think all of those things are true. I think they are true. I think they're literally true. And I don't think that there's a, you know, other than the phrase homosexual marriage, which I don't prefer, but, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't, I think it's a, but let me put it this way. Political campaigns are not conducive to a kind of larger, constructive, moral, and reflective debate generally because they're about sound bites and getting to 50 plus one um, on both sides. But, you know, in, in terms of the flood of litigation, after the California Supreme Court ruled for gay marriage, recognized the right to same-sex marriage, the Washington Blade, which is arguably the premier gay paper in America, did a, a, a Q and A about what this will mean. And one of the questions was, will churches lose their tax-exempt status if they refuse to marry gay couples? And the answer in the Washington Blade was, it's unclear, it will be worked out in a flood of litigation. Now, they may have been wrong. I actually think churches are gonna be safe. I think it's parachurch ministries and organizations. Um, I go around all the time saying to pastors are not gonna be thrown in jail because they don't marry gay couples. But I think those are legitimate issues, whether they are talked about, you know, I mean, everyone, uh, political campaigns are not are really not designed to create thoughtful debate between people who disagree. But I do think that that's a perfectly, I believe that those claims are true and reasonable to put forward. And uh, political campaigns generally are inflammatory by their nature because it's really about facing somebody's gonna win and somebody's gonna lose. And people on either side don't like losing. Well, 
Hold on one second. Do you have a follow up to that? Well, the follow up was kind of um, does this positively contribute to the discussion? You spoke a lot about how uh, removing bigotry from the discussion, and when you get involved in such highly inflammatory political debates, it seems that ads such as that only add bigotry into this discussion. I think it's fair. Listen, uh, my view on the religion, the consequences of gay marriage, particularly the religious liberty, and I, you know, I was at a conference at Northwestern Law where two major, two, two of the participants, it seemed to me, clearly indicated that they thought down the road that organizations that believe in and promote discrimination shouldn't be entitled to their tax exempt status. There's one of two truths. The first is that this idea that you're going to be treated like a racist if you maintain a traditional view of sex and marriage is that that's an unintended consequence of same-sex marriage. It isn't really what the movement has in mind. In which case, the main legislature could have but did not offer substantive religious liberty protections. It was proposed, it was fought for hard, the legislature refused to do it. Um, for whatever reasons, legislate, you know, with politicians. Uh, so either it's an unintended consequence, in which case offering religious exemptions is not giving away anything, it's just you don't need this to happen, so step forward. Or it's an intended consequence, and, you know, I feel like the American people are entitled to know. So I don't think there's anything illegitimate about that ad. I think it, now you may disagree with its claims substantively, that's a different debate. But I guarantee you, the people who made that argument believe it. So whatever we're doing, we're not lying. People are really concerned. So I think it's. A, I think what was what was offered was a, a a true vision of what people. One of the things that people are concerned about, and you know, I I, I can't rule that off the table in a political debate. Uh, back out. I'll come. I'll come to you guys. My name's Yoshi, and I uh, plan to get married to my male partner who. Uh, for, to have a loving relationship with him, to adopt kids, to have a family together, whether or not we have rights to see each other in a hospital, whether we have survivor rights or any other issues. And I also want to say that you said you've never had anyone with a child with a divorce say, say to you anything but thank you for what you've done, but let it be on the record that I am a child with a divorce saying, no thank you. <laughs> I okay, I'll, I'll say I won't say that anymore. <laughs> I did not have a father in the picture, and it, it, it worked out well, and I'm, I'm, I'm a great person for it now. And it, it's, the one thing I'd like to ask you on, on future speeches and talks, for if you're able to make a distinction between the fundamental moral disagreement and the fundamental theological disagreement that's going on here. Because when it comes down to it, I just keep you keep hearing you say again that there's something very special about marriage between a man and a woman. And when it comes down to it, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's about procreation, it's about creating a kid together. That's what you're saying. That's the specialness of it that you're saying. They can make, these are the only kinds of unions that can both make new life and connect those child in love to their mother and father. Yes, that's at the so heart of what I'm concerned so about. So that is the reason for this union that you're saying, the special reason is to mm -hmm. create these kids together that to carry your argument all the way through, you should also be able to say that if a woman can't have a kid, if she's unable to have a child, then she doesn't fall in that category. And she should not have the right to what you're saying is a special version of marriage. No, you, I disagree with that. And let me explain to you why. I, I've actually taken to calling this the unbeatable infertility argument because it strikes people as, 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 as uh, who, who advocate for gay marriage is Ir irrebuttable. Let me start again by saying throughout the entire history of marriage where every court decision explains that marriage is the, the, the public value implicated in marriage has something to do with procreation. Throughout that entire history old people were allowed to marry and infertile people were allowed to marry and yet somehow they still thought marriage had something to do with procreation. What? How? Were they just idiots? Like did they not there's a short answer, which is that every man and woman who marry can give any child they have or adopt a mother and father. And in that sense, they're all capable of... Uh, and 
<clears throat> and, and furthermore, any man in, who enters a marriage and keeps his marriage vows will not be creating fatherless children across multiple households. So in that sense, every, it's, it's rational, as three Supreme, state Supreme Courts after Massachusetts ruled, Maryland, Connecticut, and Washington State, it's rational and reasonable for the state to say, look, these couples all serve the state's purpose in marriage in a limited sense. And furthermore, I would add that none of them publicly repudiate in the same way this public purpose. It's just, I think it's not fair or reasonable to say that because some opposite sex couples, or even many of them, don't have children, that their presence in the population, of, that you know, having, having gay couples be considered by the government as married won't have any effect on the public meaning of marriage. I think it does really instantly, and I think the example, the, the professor who first spoke to me, and as I, that's an example of, the, of what happens when you commit to gay marriage. The idea that a child needs a mother and father gets translated into the idea that it's better to have two parents than one. That's, that's a reasonable principle, but it's a different principle than the one that marriage has historically been based on. Uh, back there, uh, I agree with what you're saying, that marriage between a man and a, and a woman promotes a certain social norm. Mm -hmm. But what you failed to do, logically, is, is explain why over-inclusiveness, why an over-inclusive notion of marriage can't do the same thing. And you just stated yourself, historically, marriage has been granted to uh, infertile individuals or old individuals or individuals who don't plan on having children and that over-inclusiveness has never decreased marriage's effectiveness in creating that social structure so I'd just like to hear you explain why allowing uh, homosexuals to marry would, would uh, do anything different. The, I did explain it but let me point to the explanation again. Um, I don't know that it's a matter of airtight logic. I think there are intellectual pathways to get to gay marriage that might theoretically be compatible. But the actual heart of the marriage idea is, what's, what, what do all those pink signs say? I support marriage equality. Marriage equality means something. It means there is no difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples. And I'll tell you what, I have never, again, I, I shouldn't, there's probably someone out there, but I've been debating this a long time, and I always ask my fellow panelists, would you agree that the ideal for a child is a mother and father in marriage? And I haven't yet met a strong advocate of marriage equality, at least not somebody who's out there working for it, who can say that. They can't say that because they believe that two parents are better than one, that love and parenting matters. They don't believe that the ideal is a mother and father because they believe there is no morally relevant difference between same-sex and opposite-sex couples. That's the heart of the... So you could have a pathway to gay marriage that was not about discrimination, but that's just not the pathway where, in theory, right? So you could logically construct an argument like that. But the reality of the debate we're in is it's a debate about whether or not there is anything unique about opposite-sex unions, whether marriage, our marriage tradition is discriminatory, or if it's justified, because it's not discrimination to treat different things differently. It is discrimination to treat equal things differently. That's the debate. So I, I appreciate you saying that you understand that the, the recent vote in Maine was, was an emotionally charged issue. I think yeah. a lot of people after that vote reacted in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people were very happy, a lot of people were very upset. And uh, I understand that, that after that vote, or at least what I've heard, and you can tell me if this is true, that, that you went to DuPont Circle in DC, uh, which is the traditionally gay community there. I don't know if that, that was um, at, at an invitation or, or what was going on, but kind of to watch the reaction of the gay community as they expressed their outrage and disappointment with the vote. And I was wondering why, why you decided to do that. Yeah, I did. I was in... Here's what happened. So I was in DuPont Circle at, uh, I was at meeting a, it was a business meeting in an office building, literally a half a block from DuPont Circle. And I got an email from a Republican. Uh, it was, he had forwarded me the uh, HRC's email saying they were going to have protests around the country. So I click on this to see what's going on. And I see there's a marriage equality protest 
is this is five it's five fifteen, okay, and I'm a half a block from DuPont Circle, and there's a marriage equality protest at five thirty, a half a block away from me. So I just said, I don't know, this is too weird. Maybe somebody wants me to go. I mean, I believe in showing up. I believe you show up, you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and I did it, I, you know, there were people there who seemed to think that I was somehow trying to feed off their suffering. And I, I, didn't, really, I didn't really realize how instantly recognizable I am in the gay community either, really. I didn't go there, I didn't wanna do interviews, or I didn't blog about it, I just thought, okay, for me, I'm really happy about this victory in Maine. I should go and, you know, show up or some, show up and see, you know, the reality of the people who disagree with me. And, uh, you know, as I said, I didn't. I I can walk into social conservative events and, you know, three or four people recognize me. Uh, well, I walked into Dupont Circle and they they know me. They know where I live. They know, you know, what I said about my husband at the last panel. It was an interesting experience. But my intention was, first of all, just this sense that it was too weird and there might, that maybe there's a reason why I'm supposed to go. I'll tell you, when I told my people that I was doing this, they are like, do you need bodyguards? You should have a bodyguard. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to live in that world where you have to be afraid, right? I'm just, this is normal. We disagree. It's very emotional, but I'm just going to show up like a normal person. And then I intended it as a gesture in my own head, whether this is realistic, because I didn't think of it as a public gesture, really. I just, I really thought I would just go there and there'd be a big crowd and I'd sit and watch what happened. So, but as an internal gesture of respect for people that I disagree with, you have to, you can't put yourself in a bubble. You have to, we're all Americans, you know, we share this country. I have to be willing to see in a real upfront way the people I, disagree with and it was some combination of, of that um, and you know maybe it was unrealistic or it was not received in that way but that's that's really what I intended I just in case you forget that guy over there I also want to say no thank you I was raised by my mother my father and my stepfather my parents got married when my mother was pregnant because that's what you did as good Christians four awful years later they got divorced my father didn't need the binds of marriage to keep him in my life, and my stepfather didn't need the bind of blood to love me as his own child. I have a real issue when you say that there is an ideal, because I honestly, if you say no gay advocates, marriage advocates, believe this, I don't think it's an ideal, and I don't think there is an ideal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm better off. If I hadn't had my stepfather in my life, I can't have married how much poor I would be for it. So I, I think I take real issue with your idea that there is one way, and I also want to say again, I did feel stigmatized by people like you who said that there was this ideal family and I didn't fall into it. So I just... Well, okay, but that's the substance of our disagreement then. And I'm sorry for that. I make sure you didn't forget that there are those of us who... Well, I, I, as I said, uh, what, I, what I would say is that, that and, and again, um, if, I had, if I had laid out my full case for marriage, maybe you wouldn't feel that way because we're now in a different context, but maybe you would. Uh, what that doesn't change is the reality that there are people who believe that this is an important social ideal and we need to support it. And then there, if you don't agree with that, then I don't see any reason why you wouldn't support same-sex marriage. I mean, uh, what, it, what what becomes a problem is why you support government involvement in marriage at all. But that would be a whole other debate. Why is the government doing involved in people's intimate relationships? disarming. In fact, uh, there were probably 15 points that we could all agree with and 15 points that I thought were framed in a way so as to slide us uh, away. Uh, for instance, I think we can all agree that the hatefulness it is to, to, to be condemned and is awful. And the claim of bigotry is too easy and, and too violent, too strident to, to say. But I would note that it's hard to think of 150 million Americans as the victims uh, in, in this idea of, of same-sex marriage. 
Uh, I know also, I know of no pro-marriage uh, advocates who have been beaten, killed, uh, who have been tortured, uh, and, and that's a significant difference as well. But I, I think we all agreed with you that, uh, actually I was there in 1968, it was not wild licentiousness that was threatening uh, it was a very small fringe. I want to be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and more seriously, uh, especially those of us who are parents, know that your work, trying to find one or more good parents for children, it is clearly an important and laudable. Where you frame it so as to slip us, I think, uh, into a different uh, and a much more arguable point is when you say the purpose of marriage is to produce and raise children. It would seem to me the purpose of parents is, one of the purposes is parenting, but, but marriage, it seems to me, is, is a relationship. For many of the reasons you spoke, the state has an interest in people making commitments, but the man and the woman part seems to me, it may actually be, it probably will be the norm forever, but to use that to exclude uh, a significant number of relationships uh, from, from the name of marriage, it seems to me is gratuitous, not at all necessary for the civil practicality arguments you're making, uh, and, and ultimately it, 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 it looks as if it's coming not from practicality, but from some other desire to impose one's own uh, moral theological positions? Well, all I can say is the argument as I've laid it out is what I believe. I don't do it to frame it to move you any way. I do it to try to make it visible. Let me go back to the question. I don't, in any contest of victimology, I have no, it's very hard. It, it certainly has been very hard to be a gay person and I am not setting up any kind of contest of victimology here, even in my own head or my heart. But I would t just tell you that people in my organization were beaten up on the street while they stuck, I mean, there were, people would come up and start kicking and hitting them on the street as they put up their yes on Prop 8 signs. That's reprehensible. I, no, I know you, I know you. I'm just telling you, it's also culturally invisible. So that's why I'm bothering to, I, it's, it's culturally invisible. You don't know it if you're not there. There's a woman in New York, and this was done systematically. Everyone who done it, this was, and there's no, um, it's not being done by both sides, because we don't have the cultural power. Maybe if we did, our side would be to use these tactics too. I'm not saying we're better. But, so all the donors to Prop 8, their addresses were put up on the internet, because they have to be publicly disclosed. And the net roots were kind of unleashed in them. And maybe this seems like in kind of a free speech tactic. I don't know, but I get emails from a woman who gave a couple hundred dollars to Prop 8. And she's still now, nine months later, she's getting hate mail that is just the side of a legal death threat from strangers to her home. She's asking me, do I have to be afraid to walk out my door? This is new. I'm only flagging it not because it's, it's never, I don't think it's typical in American politics. The fact that it's happening now I think is related to the tendency to delegitimate opposition, to say that it's not really about what people care about, that there's no good reason why anyone does this. So at the high level, it's all people like us who are in credentialed places. And this is getting translated into some things that are really new in my experience. I've never seen anything like it. And I do think, I don't, the New York Times is not writing stories about how this is happening to people. I mean, it just doesn't happen. Um, so I feel an obligation to make it visible. I don't think anyone should be afraid to participate in the democratic process. I don't think anyone should have their livelihood threatened. And I, it actually, the whole experience makes me more sympathetic in my you know, misguided and limited way with the experience of gay people over the years. Um, but uh, uh, it doesn't make me think that I'm wrong about what this movement is gonna mean down the road if we lose on this idea the, the core of the disagreement between us, which is whether this is a case of equality or whether it's a case of your moral preferences versus some combination of my moral preferences plus the, the public purpose. That's, 
There's many reasons for marriage. People get married for many private and personal reasons. The question that you have to answer is why does the government create this whole big apparatus around marriage? And I find it hard to come up with a, and maybe I'm just more libertarian than you are, with an explanation or justification that explains why do these people have to have sex? Why is it only two people, not three people? You know, why, if it's just about love and, why is the government there in the first place? Why are these people included and not these people? I would say that historically the answer I'm giving, I just think in an objective sense, it is the answer. It, whether it still applies in a modern context, is obviously much more debatable for a variety of reasons. So you basically just said that one of the big things is that you were asking why the government creates this apparatus of yeah. marriage in the first place. Yeah. And one of the things that I've heard throughout your talk is that it's to protect children. Um, it's really about the protection of children, not just the creation, but the protection of the outdoors. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics has a fundamental disagreement with the organization that says has said many times that legal unions, um, marriage between two same-sex individuals who have children, should be endorsed by state legislatures, by people, by the government, basically, and that failure to do so actually will harm the very children that you're trying to protect. So I dare say that none of us in this room, unless there uh, somebody with an MD in here, um, these people, the American Academy of Pediatrics, have you know a much well, great. Let's just turn the debate over to them and do whatever they say. I mean, I, I, they're going to rest on that as authority. I, I could cite the Pope, and you could cite the American Academy of Pediatrics. But if you want to go to the issue, I can explain why I disagree with it. Are we, are we having an intellectual debate, or are we having a debate about authority? Well, we're having a debate. Tell me which one you want to do. I would love to have a debate about authority, because I feel that okay. doctors who have... Right. And you believe the doctors, and you're not interested in my view. That's fine. Well, I mean, I just, I think that doctors who have studied this with more authority than others here are much, much. Okay. If it's an argument about authority, then then you 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 obey your authority. I could respond to the substantive claim, but you've just made an argument from authority, so I won't. If anyone else wants to know what I think about, you know, the actual intellectual claim and the evidentiary basis for it, I could tell you, but. If you want to say you're going to believe a college of pediatricians no matter what I say, then okay. That's what you're going to do. So, in terms of the evidentiary basis, first of all, I don't... How does, how does marriage, legal marriage, protect the well-being of children? Okay? We have a lot of research on this from our other family structure debate. And what it turns out is that the legal benefits of marriage have evidently very little relationship to child well-being. They're not nearly as strong. By the way, gay marriage, the gay marriage debate has persuaded everyone that there's a whole big set, like the government will hand you something that feels like a check if you get married. I wouldn't recommend that you get married for that reason, because you're going to be surprised at how little it feels that way. Um, but, but the benefit structures of marriage are really complex, and they can hurt you as well as help you. You can actually lose benefits because you get married. Um, the, if it were the legal structure of marriage, the benefits associated with legal marriage that protected children, you would find that children in remarried households should do better on average than children with single mothers. And that turns out to be not true. They, on average, children don't do better if their parents, re if their single mothers remarry than if they don't. The evidence from the larger family structure debate, I think, supports the reality that the primary way that, ch that marriage protects child well-being is to the extent it increases the likelihood that children are conceived and born and raised in unions of their mother and father in a committed, loving, and decent relationship. Um, and so the the College of Pediatricians may be an extremely good judge of, of medical issues, but I don't really think they're a particularly good judge of the inter interplay between family law and child well-being, actually. You may or may not be referring to, I've looked at a lot of those reports, the American College of Pediatricians, probably not lately. Um, the evidentiary base on how children fare raised by same-sex cu couples is surprisingly weak uh, compared to the strong claims made by professional associations. 
it is true that there is no study suggesting that there is a problem with gay people or uh, gay couples raising children. But having been a participant in the other family structure debate, right, if eventually we fought our way to where you could go in any room in America and say, uh, any academic room in America and say, the, you know, children, on, on average, children do best being raised by their own married mother and father, provided that marriage is not high conflict or violent. The amount of evidence it took to be able to make that claim was enormous, and it, the, the, the evidentiary base on same-sex couples is very weak. There is, I don't think there's a single study that looks at uh, two fathers raising children and can compare the outcomes of children. Almost all of it is done on lesbian mothers, for example. So that may or may not be an issue. I'm just saying, if you look at the scientific evidence, we don't, we don't really, there's almost no research on how children raised from birth by two men do. Um, and uh, the problem, there's a lot of research, not a lot, there's about 15 or 20 studies of lesbian mothers. Uh, then there's a lot of reviews of the literatures of those underlying studies, right? So if you look at the, the total universe, you'll see 60 uh, research studies, but half of them are reviews of the empirical literature underneath. So, um, and uh, the, my problem with those is, if, with taking them as definitive, is that they really are not based on probability, what the social scientists call probability samples. Okay, with, with the, again, there's a, one study by Charlotte Patterson and colleagues that uses the Ad Health, which is a large nationally representative database. But typically, you're looking at groups of lesbian mothers and their children who are in some way, at least a big chunk of them, select into the study. And that's just, in social science, it's not because they're bad researchers, it's because same-sex parenting is a very rare phenomenon, statistically speaking. It's, it would be very expensive to do definitive research, and it really has not been done. Um, so my problem with this is not that I don't think that there are gay people who are great parents, and that even on average gay people may be just as good parents. If, it's that if I were a gay parent and my child was in real trouble, and I'm in the middle of the great civil rights battle of the century, would I volunteer for a study on gay parenting? I wouldn't. So I think, from a scientific standpoint, my reading of the literature, and I have read it, most of it, is that we just don't know from a scientific standpoint. We know that there are many gay people who are good parents. There is nothing in the literature to suggest anything particularly alarming. But we just don't know, as a matter of scientific fact, how the typical child fares being raised by lesbian mothers from birth. And we know nothing at all about two fathers. So it disturbs me when professional associations start making very strong claims based on weak evidentiary basis, I think that they're doing it primarily because they think it's a question of social justice. But I don't know. You have to go ask them. That's, that's what I think about the state of the evidence. The final thing I would say is that I believe that it's possible, I will say this, that children raised by, I'm, I am a sexist really, I'm more confident about the two lesbian mothers than the two gay men, I don't know, I just, I think children need mothers and fathers, but I really think they need mothers. Um, but that's just my bias. I'm just putting it on the table for you as a woman. Um, the, uh, that it's possible that on average they do better. And if that's true, it's not because there's nothing significant about the child's natural mother and father, but because uh, lesbian couples don't get children as a matter of random sexual passion. And therefore, they you select into parenthood only those people who are most committed parents. I don't know what would happen if we did the research. I do know, I do know, I believe I do know, and I, I have no PhDs. There's no reason at all why you should believe me. Go ahead and believe the College of Pediatricians. But I do know that this is the state of the literature as it exists now. There is not a single study that takes a nationally representative sample of children raised by birth by same-sex couples, follows them to adulthood, and compares them to children in other family forms, which would be normally the minimum standard for saying we scientifically know for sure what happens in this family structure. Oh, we're running out of time here, so we have a few more questions. Like that, right? Um, coming from a historical perspective, I think that your view fails to take into account the fact that the definition of marriage in a culture has evolved over the past and has always been evolved. 500 years ago in Western Europe, the primary purpose of marriage was not a loving relationship 
were told. It was about property. You married for political allegiance to who you were told, and women had no rights in marriage once it was started. Have you, ever read, have you ever read the Anglican wedding ceremony from 500 years ago? Oh, I'm talking the church's nice words about it and what was said aside. I don't, they I mean, thought it was something to do with love. I mean, they did. Then why does every major figure we read about in history have multiple relationships on the side outside their marriage? It's okay for them to do it, but not for women. Ask Senator Bitter. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why men do those things, but... <laughs> Your viewpoint on marriage is one of many, and it's a valid one, but it is not the only one, and it has not always been predominant cultural viewpoint on marriage. Well, we disagree about the empirical facts. Marriage has changed a lot. Uh, by the way, property was more important because survival was much harder. I'm often in rooms where people say, now we marry for romantic love and property has less to do it, but somehow I don't, I don't notice that women who graduate from Boston College of Law are randomly marrying janitors, right? I mean... We have socioeconomic matching that's probably at least as intense as any time in human history. Um, because when, you know, just, just an observation. I mean, we, we, marriage can change, we can do this, but I, I, I just, we, we would have to have another different debate about the evidentiary basis for claiming that the core understanding, even if you go to property, right? You said people married for property. It's like, what is this? They couldn't figure out any other way to transfer property besides getting two people to enter a permanent sexual union that involves parenting responsibilities. Why, why don't they just sell that property instead of doing, you know, even under those circumstances, although motivations were more complex, people had less of a sense of personal choice. The family was much more involved. We, we make our own romantic commitments, and then, you know, if our mother really throws a fit, we feel like Romeo and Juliet and get married anyway. I mean, all that is true, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the reality that people understood in a really clear way back then that they were entering a reproductive alliance uh, and that that was the core of what marriage was, although they were motivated precisely because you had to, you had, I mean, it was, it was really easy for children to die on the streets, you know? You had to make sure that there was a, enough property to support them and also to build the family alliance, which is, you know, among aristocratic families, it had much more to do with how can the whole family benefit if we join this family, not only through the marriage, but through the fact that the families will be connected through the children in the future. I'm sorry, this has got to be the last question right, right here. Uh, in light of this being the last question, I wanted to ask if I could give you a homework assignment. <laughs> you, you can try. Okay. Uh, I think the best question of the afternoon was asked earlier by the gentleman up against the wall, and your response was not really sufficient for me, and I'm sure for most. Uh, when he asked how gay marriage possibly prevents straight couples from reproducing, you said it's not based upon airtight logic. No, and well, you've just reframed the question, no, so you he haven't asked, heard it. He asked exactly. You know, I thought the question, how would same-sex marriage preclude. hurt? What does, well, then the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't preclude it. The question is, why do I am concerned that it would change it in a way that diminishes it? It doesn't preclude it. Right. Okay, so if that's the only question, then we're, we're all done. Well, why, do I, why does half the American public do not find that an effective answer? Because you're saying that the ideal state is a man or woman uh, producing a child. I'm not going to start to argue with you on that. Do you uh, agree with it? Uh, I don't. I think okay. everything can be ideal as long as the child is uh, created okay. well. Um, but what you're saying is that gay marriage somehow, uh, your whole opposition to it, somehow will prevent the ideal from being formed. No, I'm saying that it will change the meaning of marriage so that marriage won't be about that ideal and that that will affect whether the ideal is realized. Right, so but I have an answer for you. Right. I actually answered this. There's a St. Thomas Law Review article. Go to marriagedebate.com. It's, it's, it's under my picture. It's called How Will, Mar How will Gay Marriage Affect Marriage as a Social Institution? A reply to Andrew Copley. I'm not with about how it affects marriage as a social institution. I'm asking how gay marriage affects Straight couples' ability to create the ideal. Family. Because gay marriage will change what marriage means for everyone in the future. And how will it prevent a straight couple from doing what they? It, want? Uh, it might not prevent a straight couple. It will prevent. It will make it much less likely that society will conspire with that individual couple to support and make real that ideal. So, so the individual straight couple will not be precluded, but the social, the likelihood that it will happen will be dramatically affected by whether or not young couples believe that's the so idea. So you're saying gay marriage 
would allow more discrimination of straight marriage? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm you saying it changes the meaning of marriage so that it's no longer about this ideal. It repudiates this as an ideal. You don't believe it's an ideal. I haven't, as I said, there's some gay marriage advocate out there, out there who does believe that's an ideal and is nonetheless for gay marriage. But they're really hard to find. I don't think I'm wrong that these two ideas are opposites. That's why they cannot both be held. We're going to pick one version of marriage or the other. And one version, and, and they're opposite ideas. So the, the question is, does the founding idea of the, of the legal and social institution matter? I think it does. I think it matters even though no straight couple will be precluded from, real, from, from achieving that ideal. I just think it's going to be less likely that they even care about that ideal to achieve it. I hope you would expound upon that better the next time you speak that. I'm sorry it was difficult for you. I'll do better. Yeah, very good. Okay. I, I know there's still people who have questions, but unfortunately we have to stop. So if maybe she's going to stick around. You're going to ask her first. I've got to catch a plane, actually, unfortunately. But thank you. Thank you for coming. I just wanted to say hi. I'm Amy. I work with Brian Kaniker at the Hi, Nice to meet you. I do have a question yeah. for you, which is, um, you know, the, the example you gave in Maine, I mean, that guy's the legitimization of his harassment was really based on the 2005 sexual orientation non-discrimination law. So my, sort my of question not, is... Sort of not. I, well, think, I, I think that complaint is going to die because they... How can it be discrimination to say marriage is a man or a woman if that's the law of the land? Well, now, there's an, there's an underlying problem that is broader that won't be addressed. But I think the marriage line does matter. It allows you oh, to I do agree. certain things. And right? I think it encourages the crowd to harass somebody like that. But I guess my basic question is, do you support sexual orientation on discrimination laws? Or do you see them as the beginning point that all of this other stuff comes out of? I, I've never taken a position. I, I would only support them with substantial religious liberty exemptions that are not in them right now. I mean, looking at what happened. But, you know, not... Mostly what I say is, I, 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 I got my hands full fighting marriage right now. No, I, I understand, so, but I, I don't know, I guess I'm one of those people who thinks that the marriage only came up once they had the grounding. Oh, they're putting the, the although it's, uh, they only have orientation discrimination laws in like 22 states.